Nice graphics, by the way. Go to Lester in Cypress, California, listening on Immaculate Art Radio. You are on with Carlo Broussard. What's your question, Lester? Hey, thanks for taking my call. And uh, Sai, a big fan of you. I, I really miss your uh, movie reviews, buddy. Oh, you're very nice. Thank you. Let's talk about this I have for no a while. Idea We've got said. a whole segment. <laughs> Carlo, Hold you can on. go ahead. No Let's just chat about this. Thank you. <laughs> Lester, you're very kind. Thank you. Okay, so quick question. Why, did, uh, why didn't Jesus call our Blessed Lady Mother and always refer to her as woman? Yes, this is a fantastic question. Before I answer it, Lester, I'm going to have to uh, give a plug for my mentor and colleague, Tim Staples, and his book, Behold Your Mother. Uh, it's a, sort of an exhaustive, exhaustive defense, biblical and historical defense of the various doctrines and dogmas uh, of, that we believe as Catholics re regarding Mary. And in that book, he addresses this question in great detail. But I'm just going to give you a sneak peek of that, Lester. And basically, fundamentally, it seems, I think we have a high degree of reasonable uh, certitude to conclude that what Jesus is doing, Lester, is he's trying to make a connection. He's trying to draw us to the reality of who Mary is, namely, she is the prophetical woman spoken of in the Old Testament in what is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Lester, do you recall how after Adam and Eve sinned, God speaks to Eve and God speaking to Satan and says, I will set enmity, total opposition separation, between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. Do you recall that, Lester? You recall that prophecy? Yeah. Okay. okay, fantastic. Yeah. So what we see there is, number one, this woman that God is referring to is going to be the mother of the Messiah because the seed that will come forth from this woman, which some scholars see to be a hint of the virgin birth of Jesus, right? Because normally the Bible talks about the seed of the man, but here it's talking about the seed of the woman. So here we have this virgin woman giving birth to this male child that's going to crush the head of the serpent. But if you notice, Lester, that woman is not of the seed of Satan. Consequently, we can conclude that this woman is sinless. She's not tainted by, uh, the, by sin and the dominion of Satan. And because she's not of his seed, we see a hint that this woman will be immaculately conceived like the first woman. Because Lester, in the Genesis narrative, Eve was called woman in the first few couple of chapters before Eve sinned. She doesn't receive her name until after she sins. So the first woman was created without the stain of original sin. She was pure, she was holy, but she failed. The new woman that God prophesies about is going to be like the first woman in that she will be created free from original sin. But unlike the first woman, she will remain sinless because there will be total opposition between the serpent, Satan, and this woman. And I think this is the historical, this is the backdrop, Lester, against which Jesus refers to Mary as woman. And if you do the biblical study, if you do some Bible study, Lester, you'll discover that all the preceding verses before John chapter 2, verse 4, where Jesus calls Mary woman at the wedding feast of Cana, what John is doing is he has various details in his narrative that parallel the first creation story. So the whole context in which Jesus says woman, it's embedded in this context of this image of a new creation. And so what Jesus is revealing to us is that this woman, Mary, is the woman of the new creation that Genesis 3.15 was speaking of. And consequently, Jesus would call Mary woman in John 19.25 when he's on the cross as he's crushing the head of the serpent. He looks to that woman, he looks to Mary and says, woman, behold your son. Do you think he's just calling her woman for, is this just a coincidence? I don't think so. And then finally, Lester, in Revelation 12, when John has his heavenly vision, what does he describe? 
but yet he describes the mother of the Messiah as the woman clothed with the sun, and she will have offspring. Her offspring would be those who keep the commandments of God. So the bottom line, Lester, I think we can conclude that Jesus is calling Mary woman at the wedding feast of Cana and on the cross precisely to connect her to the woman God prophesied about in Genesis 3.15, that woman who would be a new woman, created free from original sin and remaining sinless throughout her life, not touched by the stain of Satan. Right. Fantastic. Okay, Lester. Hey, brother, thank you so much for giving us a call this afternoon. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think most people have the same reaction to that. The first time you hear it, uh, you just sit there going, no, really? Um, but yes, this is um, this is what is taken for biblical teaching and exegesis in Roman Catholic apologetics. A dogma uh, preached against by seven popes, um, unknown in the early church, uh, never the subject of uh, sermons for hundreds of years into church history. Um, can't demonstrate that that major names uh, who lived and died, even identified as saints by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, ever had any idea of it. But you see, that doesn't matter. That, 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 that simply isn't relevant because they don't believe in Sola Scriptura, and so the Church has the right to define these things. And that's what's behind that statement from Jerry Mattatix. You have just as much epistemological warrant to believe and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is in the bodily assumption of Mary. And the bodily assumption of Mary is defined in 1950. The Immaculate Conception, which you just heard being read back as the lens through which you are to read all the texts of Scripture, uh, 1854. And so, this is what happens when you deny Sola Scriptura. This becomes biblical teaching. This becomes biblical exegesis. It's neither. It's ahistorical. It's a anti-biblical. Um, it is binding upon men's consciences uh, beliefs that are utterly not to be found anywhere in Scripture. And yet, how many of the people listening to that program that day, listening to Catholic Answers Live, uh, in their cars, in their homes, in their offices, uh, how many people sat there and went, Wow, that's cool. See, what I believe is biblical. And so, what's more, how many of us, not enslaved to Rome's traditions, would be able to give them any kind of meaningful corrective, historically, biblically, in any other way, on this particular subject? Uh, this is why we've done debates in the past on the Marian dogmas. We did a full debate on the Immaculate Conception with Peter Peter Ferraro. Is that what it was? Chris, Christopher Ferraro. Right. Right. Anyway. On Long Island, that's available on YouTube. We had the Marian Doctrines debate with Jerry Matatic. Still a classic. It's a little bit tough to listen to uh, simply because it... Uh, you know, it was a long time ago when it was recorded. <laughs> so that's that's sort of how uh, how it works. Um, but th that's why we've addressed these things. And that's why I have the little book, uh, Mary, Another Redeemer, which helps to explain these things. Uh, these are open doors through which we can bring the gospel if we are prepared, if we have the keys uh, to those doors and to unlock them. And uh, so this is, again, this ex once you listen to that, then you understand. When I talk about the divisions that exist between us, they are not divisions of our making. Uh, they are divisions of Rome's making. Rome is the one that will not repent of having defined as dogma things that were unknown to the biblical authors, unknown to the first centuries of the Christian faith. 
this this is these dogmas, especially the last two Marian dogmas and the concept of papal infallibility. These are beliefs that to call them apostolic is to make the term apostolic meaningless. Just all there is to it. And given the dogma of infallibility, how can Rome be reformed? How can Rome recognize its own errors at this point? Uh, that is a question that, that a lot of people have. And so, excellent illustration. Uh, you, know, you know, we could go through each one of these texts. You know, the, the woman in the clothes, the sun, Revelation chapter 12. You know, I remember specifically where I was when I was listening to Staples' attempt to piece that one together and not dealing uh, fully or properly with the reality that even the early church did not view it in the way that they view it today. And that there are so many problems uh, with the application of this to Mary. Um, so many of these things. But again, as we said before, given the huge edifice of theology that Rome has defined around Mary, if it can be twisted into some type of support for a Marian dogma, it will be. It has to be, because they, so, they have so little. If it's a woman, you gotta do something with it, that must be Mary. Um, so, that's the, the very essence of what you have in, uh, in Roman Catholic theology because of a denial of sola scriptura. So,